Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here. We want to welcome in all of our friends watching online with a big, warm round of applause. Come on, family. Let's give it up to all those that are joining us. We have people watching from Cameroon. Hello, Barry family. John watching from Detroit. We have people watching all the way in, let me see, San Diego, Nacogdoches, from people watching in Mineral Wells to Fort Worth and everywhere around East Texas. We're so glad that you could join in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are going to finish up our series called Rebel Heart today. This is the final message in this series, so you're getting it in a good time. We're going to start something brand new as we enter into the holiday season next week, but grab your Bibles, if you would. Genesis chapter 12 is where we're going to spend the majority of our time. Genesis chapter 12. Have y'all been interceding for my cowboys? We need to stop this service right now and just beg God for forgiveness of whatever we have done wrong to, to face this kind of torment. Lord Jesus, forgive us. This has been bad. No, 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 no. Uh, as, as we end this series today, I want to make sure that you, that you get your 80s moment. So I want to take us back to the mid-80s where long before there was MTV Cribs, there was a show with a host called, uh, his name was Robin Leach, and the show was called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Remember that? <laughs> where they would show you their super yachts and their mega mansions and all their car collection. And this is, you know, this is a, this was a huge thing because we had never seen what it looked like to reach the top of the mountain. And those celebrities that had all these amazing bells and whistles of their life uh, could show off all their life of luxury. And it's just one of those things that just make us look around our house and say, man, my house is horrible. This is a stupid thing. <laughs> Live in squalor. Make you feel horrible about, your, about yourself and about your stuff. And he would always end the show with the same, same catchphrase. It was uh, champagne wishes and caviar dreams. Remember that? That's my best Australian accent. I, I, don't, I don't do a very good one. But champagne wishes and caviar dreams. I always thought that that would, that would be how I would know that I had made it in my life, if I could drink champagne and eat caviar. Have you ever had caviar? Yes. You ever had stuffed crust pizza? The struggle is real. I'm just saying, some things are better. They're better down here. I'm just saying. The first time that you taste champagne, you're like, this cannot be the top of the mountain. This is, come, that is nasty. Caviar, you're like, mm, that, ugh, no. No, 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 no. That's, that's not meant to be consumed. The Lord did not mean for us to consume that. But he would always present that as this is the top of the mountain. This is how you would know that you are wealthy and you've made it with your life. You could finally relax and be comfortable because you are it. Champagne wishes and caviar dreams. You know, we have our own kind of biblical version of what it would mean to have that kind of that kind of luxury, that kind of pride in what you've accomplished. And before we get to Genesis chapter 12, we have to look at Genesis 11, where man builds the Tower of Babel. Man decides to come together to unite for one single purpose, and that was to build an alternate route to heaven. And by the way, man still does that today. We always want to find a separate way to get to the top of the mountain instead of doing it God's way. So man decides that they're going to build this huge tower and they call it the Tower of Babel because God comes down from heaven and makes them start babbling. He begins to confuse the languages. He's like, you guys are uniting for an evil purpose. You're uniting for pride, to put yourself on the top of this mountain, to put yourself as God. And God says, that's not going to happen. So in the midst of man doing all of these things, God begins to do something different. God begins to set his plan in motion, and God chooses one person. We call him the father of our faith. It's not Jesus, this is a man named Abram, who would later on become, become uh, known to us as Abraham, the father of our faith. Now, there are three major world religions that call Abraham the father of our faith, and that's not just, not just Christians, but the, the Jewish people, and also Muslims. Abraham is the father of our faith, so it's important that we recognize how big of a key figure that he is, just not even within Christianity, but within the world and the history of all that we see. It was a big deal. We call him the father of our faith. So in the midst of men building a trophy with their pride, God builds a nation with a promise. And there's a big difference between man's pride and God's promise. Those two things will compete with each other, and they're still competing with each other today within my heart and within your heart. What I can accomplish on my own and what God can accomplish through me with nothing but a promise when God says, step out and watch me do what only I can do with your life. So in this Genesis chapter 12, as we're reading this, 
uh, what is known in theological circles as the Abrahamic covenant. God makes a promise to Abraham. He he says, if you will step out, I'm going to do these things with the rest of your life. God doesn't give him the whole picture. God just gives him the next step and a promise of what he could accomplish if he would trust in God. God begins to make these I will statements. And this is important because uh, if you've ever read the Bible through, you're going to come across Isaiah 14 where Satan makes some I will statements. Satan says, I will ascend to the throne of the Most High. I will become like God. I'm going to establish myself. And we see the pride that causes him to get thrown out of heaven. But God says, let me tell you my, my I will statements. And God begins to make a promise to a man named Abram to establish him as the father of our faith. So that brings us up to Genesis chapter 12. God says this to Abram. He says, go from your country, from your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. That's important because God didn't tell him where he's going. He just said, go. You ever felt like God does that to your life? I, I believe God has still done that to mine. He just says, I need you to go. Where, where are we going? I'll tell you when we get close. Mm. Lord, I got to type something into Waze. I got to type something into Google Maps. I got I to gotta type something into my Apple Maps because uh, that don't work that way. We love to know the end of the destination. But here's the thing. Oftentimes, if God was to show you what the end of your life would look like, you'd say no. That's not enough for me. I want champagne wishes and caviar dreams. I want to know that the end of my life looks like I'm rich and I won the lottery. God says, I want you to step out from your land, from your family, from your possessions. And remember this, Abraham was an incredibly wealthy man. And God says, I want you to leave all that stuff and set out on a journey, a journey of faith, walking by faith. God said, go from your land and from your people, from your father's household to a land that I will show you. And then God gives his I will statements. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. There's a reason why we say that in Christian circles, you were blessed to be a blessing because it's still true and it comes from the Abrahamic covenant where God says, I'm gonna bless you and it's, those blessings are not just for you. They're for those that are around you. That's important for us to remind ourselves that the blessings from God are not just for us to consume. Aren't we special? Aren't we great? God has blessed my life. God says, I have blessed you to be a blessing. I want to bless people through you. God says, I will bless you and I will bless those who bless you. He says, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Well, I like that part of it. There's a part of me that gets a little mean streak every once in a while. Lord, if I curse them, you're going to curse them. Double curse. Don't cross me. He says, and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. And notice the next few words. So Abram went. He stepped out. He began this life of walking by faith. He went. And the Lord had told him. And Lot, by the way, his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out. Now, don't just get past that. It's in there for a reason. Age matters sometimes, but not to God. God said, step out. I want to use you. This is important for us to to get into our minds because in our Americanized version of Christianity, we kind of put our American principles up there with God, and we say, you know, God, as long as your plan coincides with my retirement plan, we're good. But understand that in the Bible, there's no concept of retirement. There's obedience or disobedience. There's usable, not usable. There's teachable, not teachable. There's yes or mm. God calls him at the age of 75 to take a step of faith. So Abram went. He set out. He took his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, all his possessions, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. It's important for us to recognize that Abram leaves this life of luxury and begins to step out on faith, begins to trust God. He leaves behind the comforts of being in an established city, the comforts of being a a well-respected person in the community, the comforts of having a business handed down to him by his father. His future is laid out. His retirement is set. But God, but God, God calls him out of a life of comfort and says, step out now. We can look at this and say, that's not, okay, cool, that's a great story, that's awesome, that's a, that's a great story. If you look at it from the perspective of someone that's young, 
Not as easy to do when you're a 75 year old retiree who has a lot of stuff. I've got stuff, you've got stuff. And I want you to see that most of us would agree with this, that, uh, that there's a, a plan for my life and that the, the, the opposite of that would be the devil's plan for my life. But once you get saved, you need to remember that there are two competing plans for your life and it's not God and the devil, it's God's plan and yours. It's my idea of what I think would be most comfortable to me and what God says, this is where you're most useful to me. And often those things are competing plans. They're parallel train tracks, but they go very different directions. One goes towards what you want and one goes towards what he wants. And every single day we have the opportunity to rebel against that part of our nature that would say, I just want to retire comfortably and live my life in peace, be able to sit in my rocking chair and watch the world go by, watch my Fox News and shoot the TV and buy another one. I want to have just enough money to shoot my television to buy another one when I don't like what they say. Like, or could it be that there's more to life than just retiring comfortably? Could it be that God still has a plan for me if I'm still breathing? God's not done. God calls Abram at the age of 75 to step out in faith. So today we want to finish up the series by one simple idea that I think is, is probably the most important that we're going to come across as we finish this, and that's to rebel against a comfortable life. Rebelling against a comfortable life. Rebelling against the idea that if I'm comfortable, that must mean I'm blessed and that God approves of everything that I do. This is important for us to recognize that sometimes just because you have money, just because you have comfort, just because you have a little bit of guarantees in your life, I'm guaranteed the next meal, I'm guaranteed that my house is, is covered in case something goes wrong, I've got insurance, I'm, I'm good, I must be blessed. Or I could recognize that there might still be more to my life than just looking for comfort. You see, every one of us is called out of comfort and into a journey of faith. And in order to be able to walk out this plan that God has for my life and your life, I've got to get real comfortable with being uncomfortable. So how do I do that? What am I supposed to process through? How, do I look, how does that look like in, in my life? I want to finish off with three things that I think are important. Here's the first of three. Number one, in order to rebel against a comfortable life, I must reframe my idea of comfort. I've got to get a better idea, a godly idea of what comfort is actually supposed to look like. Otherwise, I will mistake a blessing for purpose. I'm going to have to reframe what I think comfort is. Now, I want you to know that I'm not just saying this because the Bible says it. I'm saying it because I've had to live it as well. Some of you have, 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 have stories where you could look back in your life and say, I did not understand this, but I felt this urging from the Holy Spirit, and I knew I had to step out and do what he had called me to do. It didn't make a lot of sense. It certainly might, have, I might not have made financial sense. I found that often what God asks you to do makes no financial sense whatsoever, but it works. God's way is better. And people would look at you and say, you are a fool. Why would you leave that? And then two years later, they're like, you're a genius. How did you see that when nobody else saw it? Like, but God. <laughs> I don't get any credit for that. But God. I've had to walk this out at multiple points in my life where the Lord said, this is what I want you to do next. And you're like, are you sure? Are you, are you, are you serious? I, I don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense to me. I want you to know that the Lord has, has called many of us in this place out of a life that was comfortable and into a life of faith. And as we look back on our lives, we ought to have key moments where we say, I trusted God there, and I trusted God there, and I didn't understand at the time that looked dark, that looked hard, that looked incredibly difficult, but I still trusted the Lord, and I was able to see his hand come through and walk me through the other side of that issue. That's, that's important for us as believers to have moments that we look back and say, but God... I obeyed, and he came through. Instead of saying, I did what was smart, I did what was wise, and I'm retiring comfortably, and I'm hoping that God blesses that, which is generally how I find most believers. I want to do what I want to do, and I'm, my idea of, of blessing would be, God, just bless the things that I want to do. That's not God. That's Santa Claus, but good luck. <laughs> good luck with that one. God is calling each of us into a life of faith, and in order to be able to step out of a comfortable life, I have to reframe my idea of comfort. What does that look like for us? I want to share, I want to share it with you this way. God wants our comfort to come from being in the center of his will. 
to being directly in the center of his will. And often the center of God's will may not be the most physically or mentally comfortable place. I have found that in the midst of my afflictions, in the midst of my trials, in the midst of the things that I'm stressing out about, that I'm still right in the middle of the center of God's will. And still struggling? Yes. And still worrying? Still having a little bit of anxiety? Of course. And you're going to find a lot of biblical characters that had the same thing happen to them. Was this an easy journey for Abram? No. He walked through one issue after the next. But by faith, in the promise of God, he kept going. So the Apostle Paul calls God, in, in, in 2 Corinthians, he calls him the God of all comfort. I love that scripture. I preach that at funerals. I love that. It brings a lot of, of comfort to me, recognizing that he is the God of all comfort. But don't forget the second part of that scripture. Who comforts us in what? Why, <laughs> why would God just take all afflictions away from us and never give us a comforter? By the, by the way, in Acts chapter 2, the comforter came. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit our comforter. This is how we can walk through difficult seasons. We have a comforter. We have someone that comes along and says, it's going to be okay. Keep trusting God. Keep stepping out in faith. Don't stop now. You're going to walk through afflictions. You're going to walk through dark days. You're going to walk through difficult situations. Your life will not look perfect, even on paper. As a believer, we are going to walk through difficult situations. Never let people get that theologically messed up for you that once you accept Christ in your life, that your life is going to be nothing but champagne wishes and caviar dreams. It's not true. We often tell those that want to go into ministry, you know, we, we, we attract a lot of young leaders, and I love that about this church. There's a lot of people that want to do what God has called them to do, and that's a mark of a healthy church. And they want to step into ministry. And you have to make sure that they understand what that looks like. You have to understand that counting the cost still applies to this platform. And one of the things that we will tell them is, you know, when you say yes to Jesus, when you say yes to the calling and ministry, that doesn't come with a suit and a microphone. It comes with a breaking. It comes with the removal. It comes with the sanctification. There are things that you can't get away with that everybody else can do. But it's a holy calling. And I tell them like this, in theological terms, it ain't sexy. It comes with the breaking off of your pride. It comes with the breaking off of your will. It comes with the breaking off of what you think your life needs to look like. It doesn't look comfortable. But we get comfort in the midst of our afflictions from the God of all comfort. That's where our comfort comes from, from his presence, not from the blessings. Now, let me make sure that you hear me. There are incredible blessings with falling after the call of God. Incredible things that you will never get to see without stepping out in faith. But there's a balance. Abram had to walk through a lot. He had to watch his nephew go towards Sodom and Gomorrah. He had to watch his father be put into the ground. He had to watch his wife struggle with infertility in the midst of stepping out in faith. But God, I'm doing what you asked me to do. God, I'm supposed to be comfortable. No, God called him out of comfort and into the center of his will to comfort him in the midst of his afflictions and to teach him what walking by faith looks like. And he's still teaching the same things to people like me and you today. Here's what I found in our, in our screwed up world that we live in. We fall in love with comfort and we forget to take up our cross. We forget what it means when Jesus says, you're gonna have to die daily to your flesh to take up your cross and to follow me. There's a price to pay for following after Christ. And it looks like trust and obedience when I don't understand and when it's not comfortable. So Abram walks through a lot of stuff, but he recognizes the simple truth that I can be comfortable in hard times because God's with me. David echoes this in the most famous psalm of all time in Psalm 23. Lord, you're with me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. Your rod, your staff... They comfort me. You are with me. So just because you walk through difficult times doesn't mean that God has left you. Often those are the times that he's closest to you. Those are the times when you learn, when you grow, when you recognize that my faith is more than just what I say. It's how I live. I live by 
faith. So I'm going to have to rebel against that idea of, of comfort in the conventional sense. I've got to reframe my idea of what comfort looks like. Here's number two. I want to share this with you. In order to rebel against a comfortable life, I'm going to have to travel light. Somebody say travel light. Travel light. Now, Abram moves from modern-day Mesopotamia, from Ur of the Chaldees, uh, to a, from an established place with a city to living in a tent. And for those of you that have ever had the wonderful privilege of living in a tent for more than a weekend out at Lake of the Pines, more than a weekend out at Beaver's Bend, if you've ever had to actually live in a tent, let me just tell you, you can't take all your stuff with you. You've got to travel light. You've got you to downsize, right? There are some things that you would look at your life and you're like, if I'm going to have to live in a tent... Um, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to let some of this stuff go, right? Now let me just let me just be 100 honest with you. I am spoiled rotten in a lot of areas of my life. There are some things that I, I I'm praying that God never asked me to lay down. One is my travel pillow. Oh, I sleep so good. I am privileged to be able to travel all around the world. The Lord has called me to be able to do incredible things and see incredible new sights. I love that adventure. But if I've got my pillow, I'll be okay. I've slept in some uncomfortable places, but I've got my good travel pillow. I'm great. Now, if the Lord ever calls me to lay that down, I would struggle. I also have a personal little travel fan that is battery powered. Even if I, where I'm sleeping has zero power, I got eight straight hours of fan. I like me some comfort. There are some things I don't want to be delivered from. I have a nice, expensive office chair. Never buy the cheap office chair. If you've got to sit in an office chair, if you've got to sit there for a long time, counseling people, doing research, sitting in front of a desk, get a nice chair. And let me tell you, once you get past the age of 40, spend the money on a good bed. A good mattress comes in really, really handy. Now, if I'm living in a tent and you're sleeping on an air mattress, oh, I'm not 15, man. Air mattresses are really, really good if you want to go to sleep on the floor, but just not right now. That's, <laughs> that's an air mattress. I like having nice things. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. Let me make sure that you see this, that God doesn't care that I have things. He doesn't want things to have me. He doesn't want things to have my heart. He wants me to be completely and totally dependent upon him and to recognize that all that I have is a blessing from him because I'm walking by faith. And it's to be a blessing to those that I encounter along the way. You are blessed to be a blessing. You're called to walk by faith. So the Bible tells us this in Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old. So we fast forwarded into his life from 75 to 99. The Lord said, I am God Almighty. What are you asking of me, God Almighty? He tells, he tells him this. Walk before me faithfully, and be blameless. Let me just remind you, it's not just about stuff that brings us comfort, because many of us get real comfortable, please look at me, in our sin. We get really comfortable hanging on to areas of our life that God says, that doesn't belong there. I want that. But Lord, this has been a part of me since I was 12. Lord, I like this since I was this age. And Lord, I really like this part of my life. And that's just my little secret. That's, I've given you all this area of my life, but this part, I really like. I know that this doesn't belong in the life of a believer. I know that, that your word is against. I know that this is a sin issue, but I really like it. In order to be able to step out in faith, to follow the call that God has for you, we have to make him Lord of all, not Lord of most. And there's a daily submission of ourself to the calling of God. Where I can die to my flesh. Where I can let go of things that I didn't think I could let go of. I can walk away from addictions and know that God is better. Or I can walk away from things that I thought was my identity because God is better and his love is better than life. And I recognize that if I can step out by faith and let go of the things that I know are keeping me from God's best for my life, then I might be uncomfortable, but I'm walking by faith and I'm pleasing to God. God says, walk before me, walk before me by faith and be blameless. The good news is because God sent his one and only son to die on a cross for us, he has covered my sins once and for all. I can walk blameless before the Lord because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm never going to sin again. That sure would be nice, though, if once you ask for forgiveness of all of your sins and you just never sinned again. That'd be great. But unfortunately, we live in a fallen world, and I've got a messed up mind, and I have a flesh just like you do. 
There's a person living inside of me that I have to choose to starve. Because I recognize that that person doesn't lead me anywhere but where I've already been. That's the part of my life that's always there. I always think, can I, can I be in the driver's seat today? I have to choose to starve him out. How do I do that? By faith. By walking before the Lord. Blameless. By keeping short accounts with God and by staying submitted to his plan. I want to share that, that, that wisdom with you. That's something that my dad gave me a long time ago. If you're going to walk in the ministry, you want to walk by faith, you better keep short accounts with God. Don't allow the things that you did yesterday to sit and to fester and to become strongholds in your life that you keep coddling. Keep short accounts with God. Get that right before the Lord immediately. Stand up right before him. Come boldly into his presence. Say, Lord God, forgive me. I didn't mean to do that. Please help me. You keep short accounts with God and you stay submitted to his plan. If I want to rebel against a comfortable life, I've got to reframe my idea of comfort and I've got to travel light. Somebody say travel light, travel light. by staying submitted to the Lord asking for quick forgiveness. Here's the final thing I want to share with you as we finish out this series. Number three, I must step out in faith and look at me, keep stepping out in faith. Here's what we come against in Longview, Texas. A lot of believers that have taken steps of faith when they were young. And they would get really comfortable where we're at. As Lord, as, uh, Lord, as long as I've got my fire insurance, then we're good. But Lord, I, I, I really like my comfortable life. I really like my house. I really like my life where it is. And we get this idea that if I step out in faith, that God's going to say, you better burn all that to the ground. Um, I've not found that to be the case, honestly. I found the Lord just saying, can, can I have that or is that yours? Can, can I use that for my glory, or is it for your pride? Can, can, that, can that be used for, for, for my plan and purpose, or is that your personal tower of Babel, this tower that you build to yourself with your own pride? Can I make you a promise? Can you step out and let me make you more than just a comfortable Christian? See, if I want to rebel against the life of comfort, not only do I have to step out in faith, every one of us will have to do that at some point. You're going to have to keep stepping out in faith. So when God tells Abraham, get up and go from your country, he uses the, the Hebrew word halak, which doesn't just mean to get up and go. It means to walk and to come. So it's almost like God is saying, get up and go and come towards me at the same time. God is on both sides of that saying, not only am I behind you pushing you, but I'm in front of you pulling you. He's going to help you. Come on, step, step out by faith. Walk towards me. Show me that. It's a, it's a step of faith to believe that God is waiting for me in front of me. I'm not stepping out into the great unknown. I'm stepping towards the God that I can know. The God that says, listen to my voice and take a step. But it's dark and I don't know. Step, step this way. I got you. But Lord, I'm not sure if I can do that. Step this way. I got you. Lord, I'm not sure if you're, you're going to back me up. Come on, step this way. I got you. Halak. Don't just get up, but take a step and keep stepping towards me. So the Bible tells us this in Hebrews chapter, chapter 11. By faith, Abraham obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. I'm thankful that God didn't just make me do that, but, but somebody else. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how this is all going to work out. But he obeyed and went. For he was, look at this, looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder was God. Why is it so important that we recognize the foundations part? Because when you've been living in a tent, it's nice to look, some, to look forward to something that has a little bit of foundation to it, right? It's, it's nice to not be just stepping on sand, to not be walking on rocks, but to find yourself at a place with a foundation, whose builder and maker, whose architect, whose designer. It's God, not me. By faith, it said, Abraham went. He obeyed. I want to remind you that we call him the father of our faith for a reason. Everything kind of goes back to Abraham. This is where God fulfilled his promise of sending his son, of be, being the, the savior for his people through one man, through Abraham, through his faith. 
And it's easy for us to look at his life and say, yeah, but that was for him. He was a, he's a man of faith and he did it all right until you kind of hear the, the, the more in-depth version of the story. And we find that, by the way, in Acts chapter 7. So there's a young man named Stephen. Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit. He's just about to be stoned to death and not in the way that you did in, in college, like stoned for real. <laughs> he's about to be stoned to death for his faith in Christ. And he gives one last sermon before they stone him to death, and he starts talking about the father of our faith. He starts it off with Abraham. He said, by faith, Abraham was called out of Mesopotamia, which, by the way, is before he gets to Haran. So before we even catch up to the story in Genesis chapter, chapter 12, God had already called him earlier. So Stephen tells us a part of the story that we're not quite sure of before. We're like, wait a minute. So God didn't necessarily just call Abraham when he was 75. It's saying that God had called him from before. It just took him that long before he actually stepped out and did it. That gives me hope. That gives me hope that even the father of our faith didn't always get it right. He had mistakes along the way. You talk about the man that was willing to sacrifice his son? Yes. And the man that was willing to kind of rush God's process and take a little second Mormon wife, sister wife on the side? Well, maybe this is what God wants for me to have a little girlfriend. Like, even the father of our faith had some issues. He didn't always get it right. He tried to jump God's plan and to make stuff happen on his own timetable, as did his wife. Oh, God's going to give us a lot of kids? Well, I'm 100 years old, so uh, let's find somebody that can actually do this. That must be what God wants. God says, no, no, no. Trust me for the miraculous. Abraham didn't always get it right, and he's the father of our faith. Abraham believed, and God says, you're my friend, even if you don't always get it right. I want you to, to be reminded that everything with God begins with a step of faith, a step of faith. From the moment that you believe that Jesus Christ saved you from your sins and he's forgiving you and, and he's going to uh, take your life and redeem it, it takes a step of faith to believe that and to confess it out with your mouth. It takes a step of faith to get into a baptism tank and to let somebody hold you down until the sin bubbles stop coming up. It takes some faith to do that. It takes some faith to go to growth track, which is happening in the next service. It takes some faith to say, I want to be part of this family. It takes some faith to grab a, 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 an envelope right in front of you that says giving and to start submitting your finances to the Lord. That's a step of faith. We get really comfortable doing the ones that we like, not the ones that we don't like. Everything with God begins with a step of faith. And we see this, by the way, from the life of Abraham that still applies to us today. The fulfillment of that promise was delayed until the order was obeyed. God didn't fulfill that promise from day one. But through the process of him letting go of things that God asked him to let go of and stepping out in faith, God says, now, now I can use you. He'll do the same thing to you as well. You know, if you ever get bored with a sermon, and please, not today, but maybe sometime in the, in the future, you, you have a paper Bible, you can kind of turn over to the back of the Bible, and you see all the maps. You ever, you ever remember that growing up as a, as a, as a kid in, in Sunday school, and you're like, okay, this is boring. You turn over to the back, and like, oh, look at this. If you ever, like, look at the maps of where, of where Abraham traveled when God called him out of, his, out of his comfort, and God called him from Mesopotamia to Haran to Ur, all the way into Egypt, and then back into, and back into Canaan, and in modern-day Israel, when you, when you look at the... You look at the map of his travels, it didn't go in a straight line. 700 miles to one point, then 800 miles by foot to another point, then 700 miles back, and then 800 miles back into Egypt. Like, that's a lot of traveling in circles. There's a reason why it takes faith to be able to follow after the Lord. Because we have to believe that his plan is better than our straight line. I just want to get there as soon as possible. Make it all work. Or it's more about the journey of walking by faith, trusting the Lord with the next step. But Lord, I feel like I've been here before. But Lord, I feel like I've seen this. Lord, I feel like I already dealt with that. And God says, I want to deal with it on a deeper level. This time you're coming back from, from this angle. The Lord has a perfect plan. I want to finish up this series with a simple statement that hopefully will give you a lot of comfort. It'll help you to recognize the importance of stepping out of a life of comfort and walking by faith into who God has called you to be. And the statement is this, that God's path for my life may not always be a straight line, but every twist and every turn is part of a perfect design, shaping me, guiding me, and leading me toward a purpose that's greater than I can see. I'm looking forward to a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God.
This is not heaven. I don't expect heaven on earth. I'm thankful for God's blessings. I'm thankful that my family is good. I'm thankful that I know where my next meal is coming from. I'm thankful that I have a, a house that doesn't have a leaky roof. I'm thankful I don't have to live in a tent. But I recognize that those are blessings from the Lord that he has chosen to bless me with. He can take away at any moment. And if I can simply say every single day, Lord, my life is yours. I submit it to you. Everything I have belongs to you. And God will say, come on, let me establish my covenant with you. These are the people that God is looking for. These rebel-hearted people that will submit to him and walk into a life of purpose. The great adventure that is walking by faith. I'm believing that that's you and that's me. That's what God is doing with this church and with this people. He's helping us to do things differently. To think differently. To process differently. To walk differently. We walk by faith. Can you receive that, everybody? Is that okay? As we finish up right there, I want to invite you to go ahead and put down your phones and your Bibles. And if you're watching online and you believe that this is a, a good message for your world, would you do us a huge favor? Click the share button. If you're hearing this message, it means the world to us. When you share this with your, with your social media influence, it is, it is shocking what God can do when people would simply step in and become part of this process. So I want to invite you, man, if you like this, man, click the share button. Uh, it's going to encourage and bless a lot of people that simply don't have access to the things that we get access to. They don't have access to the word of God. They don't understand what it means to be plugged into a church family. And so this, this might be the only church that some people get this week. So don't be afraid to let the Lord use you to share this video with those that, are, that, are, that might be needing it. So would you mind bowing your head and closing your eyes as we finish up today? And I want to give you a chance to maybe respond to what God might be telling you. For some of us, I think if I've done my job correctly, the Holy Spirit is saying you've gotten really comfortable and I want you to step out in faith. That may look like you, you need to get baptized. And just me saying that kind of already confirms it in your spirit. You need, you need to sign up for baptism. Let us help you with that. Maybe for others, it's, it's, it's time that you start giving. You've never trusted God with your finances. You've kept a strong, strong stranglehold on your finances, so afraid that you wouldn't have enough, that you won't trust God to be a part of his bigger purpose with your money. I want to encourage you. Hey, step out in faith. Trust the Lord with your finances. Watch what he can do. I want to challenge you with the scripture in Malachi 3 where God says, won't you test me in this? For others, you've never been a part of a church or maybe you've just come out of a church, you've been hurt. I want to encourage you to get back into a church family. We need you and your church family needs, needs your story. You need this. We have our growth track happening here in, in about 30 minutes in the room right behind me. We'd love for you to be a part of this church. We'll tell you what we believe and where you fit. Maybe you've, you've never served. Maybe your life has been full of selfishness where you've only served yourself. We want you to serve here. We want you to find your spot and do what God's called you to do by stepping out in faith. Maybe for others, the Lord is calling you a season of rest, and it takes a lot of faith for you to just stop and to breathe to rest you know part of being spiritually healthy is learning to honor the Sabbath and a day of rest whatever that faith step may look like for you would you simply say to the Lord right now Lord I'm all yours I submit to you whatever faith step you have for me I trust you Lord call me out of my comfort and into a journey of faith and I trust that what you have for my life is better than what I'm walking away from. I want to be used by you. Thank you, Lord, for choosing me. And now with heads bowed and eyes closed, with no one looking around, maybe you're here today, or maybe you're even watching online, and you would say, Pastor, if I'm going to be honest with you, I've not taken that first step of faith where I've asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I've not taken that first step of faith where I've desired a relationship with the Lord. I need that. My friend, if you want a relationship with Jesus right now where you are, I want to lead you in a prayer. The same prayer that somebody led me in many years ago that changed my life. And if you want a relationship with Jesus, if you want forgiveness for your sins, if you want his free gift of salvation, then right where you are, you can pray this prayer with me. I'll tell you what to say. Just say these words with me. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that you came and died for me. And I believe that you can forgive me of my sins. Please forgive me. I've messed up. I need you. Now say this, Jesus, I give my life to you right now. And I trust you with my future. 
thank you for saving me. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer with me and you're not embarrassed or ashamed to admit it, my friend, I will not embarrass you in any way. But if that was you and you prayed that prayer, would you do me a favor? Would you look up at me and go ahead and slip your hand all over this place? I, I did that. I prayed that prayer with you, Pastor. That was me. Can I just see your hand all across this place? Yes. I see you there. Good for you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Young man, I see you. Good for you. Good for you. Those of you in the balcony, good for you. Perhaps you're watching online today and you say, that was me, Pastor. I did. I prayed that prayer. My friend, there's a, there's a phone number appearing on the screen in front of you right now. I want to encourage you. Would you text me? Text the words, I prayed, to that number on the screen, and I'm going to send you the link to some things that will help you understand what just happened in your heart and what to do next. If you're watching in our service today, that number is available for you as well. We would love for you to take that next step of faith and letting us encourage you to keep walking with the Lord. This is not the end of your relationship with Jesus. This is the beginning. Let us help you. It's good for you. For everybody else, go ahead and look up at me if you would, and let's stand to our feet together as we end our service. I'm going to have our elders and their wives step forward, and they're going to be available to pray for you about anything that you might need prayer for. We believe that God still answers prayers. Do you believe that, people? Do you believe God still answers prayers? So if you're walking through a season where you're like, I wish somebody would pray for me, this is for you. So as we finish the service, these guys will stay right here and make themselves available. And for everybody else, if you want to join us in fasting and praying for my beloved Dallas Cowboys this week, they could sure use it. We need, <laughs> we, we need some miracles. Come on, somebody. I have my friends trying to convince me to become Baltimore Ravens fans, and I'm having a hard time saying no. Mm. Help them, Jesus. <laughs> Let me just bless you and send you out if that's okay. Father, would you bless my friends with an incredible week? Would you watch over them? Help them, Lord, to walk by faith and trust you for greater things to come. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of us said together, amen. God bless you as you go. I hope you have an awesome week.